enga mana, enga waka, enga reo, e rauranga tirama. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. It's great to be back for another edition of Auckland's Future Now, and I'm thrilled to be here alongside a, a fabulous lineup representing diverse sectors, skills, and communities. And those of you who are here in the morning, please don't expect me to sing. We do want you to stay for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, we're here to talk about the changing workforce. While Auckland's future now started as a response to COVID-19, and while COVID-19 has had significant implications on our workforce, it must be stated that actually our workforce was changing even before COVID. And Sir Peter Gluckman talked uh, a bit about this this morning. As a society, we are aging. Don't want to make a fine point of it, but look around the room. Um, by 2036, 22% of us will be over 65. We are increasingly more ethnically diverse too. We are home to more than 213 ethnicities and 160 languages. Almost 40% of Kiwis identify as Maori, Pacific or Asian, and here in Auckland, it's as high as 55%. Not quite 55% in this room, but I live in hope. A quarter of us weren't born here, and in Auckland, again, nearly 45%. That's a large number of people with international connections and knowledge and experience that we can be leveraging. One in four of us have disabilities. I could go on, but you get the picture. You know, we ignore these demographic shifts at our peril. We had skill shortages pre-COVID, and we are seeing more marked gaps in some sectors compounded further by closed doors, closed borders, and, and you'll hear from the panel about this. You know, perhaps one of the more significant changes that came um, through as a result of COVID was the role of technology in how we work, where we work, how we train, and where we train. We made good gains, but we were also confronted by the digital divide. We saw our already marginalized communities being marginalized even further. And so to discuss some of these themes, I have uh, with me a panel here uh, who need no introduction really, but, but I will introduce them. Uh, Cecilia Lynch is the Regional Director of Workforce Development for the no uh, Northern Region's four district health boards via their shared services agency, the Northern Regional Alliance. And her role is to secure and develop a sustainable health workforce fit for our future. Big job. Um, Warwick Quinn is the Deputy Chief Executive Employer Journey and Experience at Te Pukenga. Uh, and the Chief Executive of the BCITO Motor Trade Association and Registered Master Builders Association. Robert Reed has over 40 years experience in trade unions and in community employment. He's currently President of First Union and also co-chair of the Regional Skills Leadership Group. Beatrice Famowina, uh, perhaps better known as a world champion athlete, uh, but she wears many other hats too, including as Strategic Relationships Manager for the Pacific Business Trust and a director on several boards. So I'll kick off by asking the panelists some questions, and as you have done throughout the day, please send through your questions on Slido, uh, and we'll get to them as well. So first up, if I can ask each of you to share with us what is top of mind for you when you're thinking about the changing workforce, and maybe we'll start with you, Cecilia. All right, thank you. Uh, kia ora, everybody. Um, Five points I really want to make about uh, the health workforce. Um, some of it you may already know. I need to talk quickly. I've got those numbers in front of me here. Um, the DHBs in the health sector in the wider, in the wider context is the, one of the most major significant um, employers in the city and has a major economic footprint. You probably realise that. Um, the DHBs directly employ about 29,000 people, um, and you could probably double that of those working out in the wider health sector. So it's a really important um, employer and contribution to the city's um, growth and uh, economic prosperity. 
The other thing is that our hospitals are very large training organisations that's often overlooked because um, we hear about, obviously, the uh, patient care delivery and the, the, um, the gnashing of teeth about the shortages and the, and the struggles that the sector is facing. Um, but we are, we are large training organisations. We have thousands of students come through our hospitals and into our wards and into our services learning how to be a health professional. Um, we have something like 1,500 doctors in training at any one time. We bring in 500 new graduate nurses every year into our Metro DHBs, and that's just a small portion, really, of the, of the total, as you can imagine. So it's important to remember that. The other thing is our workforce is not only local and regional, it's also national and international. And you've probably talked about the global shortages um, of workforce, particularly in the health sector. It is massive and it's going to get worse, particularly in response to the COVID pandemic uh, internationally. Uh, we can fully expect the UK and Australia to come knocking on our door to take our trained workforce, um, which has a huge impact on us in terms of not only our service delivery to patients, but also our ability to train uh, new people so quite a significant um, impact there. Um, having said that, COVID, the response to the COVID has also seen an increase in our local employment as well. And you've seen that happen out in the community in terms of the testing stations, the MIQ facilities, and our vac vaccination rollout. Um, so there has been a benefit, I think, um, in that we're able to employ more people from our community for those roles. The DHBs have long recognised the importance of growing our own workforce. We talk about the reliance on overseas trained workforce and we'll always have a that to a degree because we're a small country, um, but we need to get that balance right. Um, and we have attempted to grow our own for a long time, it's not new, but it's becoming even more and more critical, I think, for our city, for us to be able to access uh, young people in our communities and to get them onto a pathway and a career pathway and a training pathway that enables them to have a, a good career in, health, in the health sector, not just in low paying jobs, but in those that take them right through into a number of careers. The reason I say that, of course, is that, as you well know, we've got a significant population growth explosion in this region in the next 20 years. We're expecting a growth of something in the order of 600,000 people, which is more than any other cities in New Zealand. Um, so for us to continue to train and grow our workforce incrementally in the ways that we've had or struggling to grow our workforce, even with the growth that we've had, is not going to work. We can't also just keep training the way we've been training. It's a bit like having a hamster wheel. We just can't get that hamster wheel going faster and faster. That is not going to serve us in terms of the workforce we need. Um, we need to certainly increase supply, we know that, but we need to train them in a different way. And I'm sure that you've already talked today about being digitally enabled. Um, the DHBs are already gearing up in terms of their technology and in terms of their facilities infrastructure to cope with this growth. We need to have a workforce pipeline that will also fit that approach as well. So things like different, different ways to train, um, we have pressure on our teaching hospitals in terms of the ability to take more and more students. Um, so we need to think of different ways to do that so that we relieve that pressure and we can train more, certainly, but also they need to work in a different way. Health services will shift um, we'll shift things into the community as much as we can. People will work more locally, and we need to have far more skill sharing, what we call skill sharing in the health sector, skill delegation, advanced practice across different professional groups, and far more interprofessional team working. That's probably as much as I can say today. Thank, thank you. you very much. We'll go to you, Warwick. Do you want to thank you. Uh, what keeps me awake at night? Obviously, you've talked about it this morning already, our ageing population coupled with our reducing birth rate. In two years' time, we peaked 15 years ago at some very low number, and then our birth rate, our birth rate free falls for the, uh, up until today. So those things coincide in about 10 years' time to the perfect storm. So if you think you've got a skill shortage now, just wait. And other countries are having similar problems. So we have a real issue on our hands. So for me, that completely changes the dynamic on how we train where we get our resources from, and how we address these problems. Uh, no longer can we afford to have education and employers separated. 
They need to be joined at the hip. Every dairy shed, every classroom, every building site, every hairdressing salon is a classroom, is a teaching environment, and we need to include employers in that provision. Not treat them as a taker, treat them as part of our national network of teaching within the far now of vocational education. Our employers are not up to the task yet to teach well. We have poor outcomes for certain groups. We have poor outcomes across the board, both internally and externally. We need to lift the teaching capability of firms to cater with not only the changing dynamic that happens with our numbers, but the diversity. Uh, you know, just because I can hammer in a nail straight doesn't mean to say I can teach you to hammer it in straight. And yelling at you to hammer in straight isn't going to help. So teaching in itself is a skill, and our employers must be able to do that, because most of our firms where the learning is done in this country is with firms that have five or less staff who don't have the capability and infrastructure and the support mechanisms to do it themselves. We have to help them change the way in which it's delivered and no longer have long-term programs where you take years to come out, but recognise that skill set throughout the journey and apply it as you go. That's completely changing how we do some of our delivery. Thanks, Warwick. Robert? Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, I'm not sure if it was a saying or a song, but um, of what's top of mind is probably the phrase, at least, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, and I guess from a, a, a trade union or workers' point of view, um, coming through the COVID period and now uh, uh, looking uh, into the future, um, in various sectors of, of, the, um, of the workforce, we've seen different things uh, happening. If, if you had been a, a worker in a small, non-IT connected retail firm or a tourist firm or in the um, uh, international tourism hospitality, you were vulnerable through, uh, uh, through COVID and your job is probably still vulnerable now. Although in the larger firms, um, we find that people, uh, the larger retail firms, people um, uh, uh, are actually taking on workers um, and your job is reasonably safe. The same in manufacturing, transport and logistics. In, um, in the construction uh, side, um, we have seen what initially uh, was, I think, a knee-jerk reaction from the main tier one construction companies um, of actually putting people off, putting contractors off, um, now coming back. And in fact, we know that construction firms, whether they're at the top tier one or the subcontractors or the sub-subcontractors, are now calling out uh, uh, for, for skilled workers. And one thing that doesn't ever change is the strawberry farm from down near the airport still complains that it can't get people to work for it um, because they're not really paying the minimum wage. So those are the things that are changing but, but, but not changing. Um, and um, I, I guess we'll, we'll come on to the other stuff later and there's already some interesting, uh, 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 already some interesting questions uh, there. Um, but it is in that skills area that I think we have to have the discussion. But it's also in jobs. There are still going to be people who are cleaning uh, our offices. There are still going to be people doing the fencing, planting uh, our forests. So I just want, uh, I'd like our discussion to be wider and to take into account not just the top high level skills, but how all people, all workers in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, are, are able to uh, live a good life um, in the years that are to come. Thank you, Robert, and that's why we have you on the panel. It's the voice of the people. Beatrice. Thank you for the kind inclusion in today's discussion. Um, firstly, before we progress, can I ask all of those that are of our Pacifica descent to please stand? In addition to this group, can I ask those that have a workforce that's focused on looking after Pacifica, Māori and Asian community? The reason I've asked these people to stand in the room is because I work on the same journey with you. 
the challenge that we have is the opportunity to see more of these people across our nation in varieties of organisations. Um, so what keeps me up at night is, in the Pacific business world, we talk about the ability to build capability and capacity for our leaders, and we do it for our self-employed, our sole traders, SMEs. But also what I want to see is progression right through all our organisations where I see more Asian Pacifica Māori representation around that decision table. We all know that that cultural diversity point is going to enrich New Zealand at 100 miles per hour. We know that. It's in our backyard. So the challenge that I'm asking everyone here is to consider that. What would it look like for you? And how would it advance your community? Thank you, Beatrice. And if we can start with you with the first okay. question leading on from that, uh, sure. which is one here that's getting a bit of attention, is how can we help mainstream businesses to see and engage the Pacific potential in New Zealand uh, more than just the labour workforce and RSE workers? So one of the key things for us this year has always been about community consultation. Creating solutions that have been about conversations with our community versus the other way around, which was buying a shelf model and then trying to put our people into it. That was not going to work. One of the things that we did well at PBT was when we were looking at solutions for our people, it was asking them the tough questions, but also being recipients of some of those tough answers. Areas that we needed to improve, but also be responsible enough to say, hey, we haven't done well there, we need to improve on it. When you can do that and deliver, then we've got the solutions that our people are after. So for example, we've got a social enterprise summit that's coming out June 17th. That's a follow-up from the one that we had two years ago. Social procurement readiness program, that is also ready. It's been up and running, it's for our construction, because our people are asking us, how do we compete in this arena? And then once COVID hit last year, it was around providing information that gave them the guidance of where to seek help. So even if it wasn't about business support, it was reaching out to our health sector. What I absolutely admire, admire most about our people, people like from South Seas, the Fornal, Vakatau Tour, when the call came to therefore get a test, they came. The messaging was bilingual, because in our homes, it's generational. And so they be multifaceted, it was about engaging with everyone. Thank you, and so if I can just go with that health connection to you, Cecilia. Um, you talked about the significant skills shortages in the health sector, but one of the things that you've mentioned to me is around uh, training, that you can't just train people, you know, when they're um, already in the workforce, there's some things that you can do. You need to build that pipeline right from a school level, particularly for health. So could you talk to us more about that and also how we do we ensure that our health workforce is representative of our society? Sure, that's a big question. Um, we have to train uh, new people and young people, but we also have to reskill our existing workforce. Don't forget that. So there's two elements to that. So we talk about our pipeline, which is really important for supply. If I just concentrate on that, we need to make sure that those young people, particularly in our Pacific and Māori communities, have the opportunity to access these career pathways. At the moment, they do not very well at all. Um, so there is work to do, and there's work happening, but there is more work to do in terms of being able to provide access to them and opportunities. That's critical. We need to grow our Māori and Pacific workforces and totally agree with that at all levels of our organisation and around those decision-making tables for sure. Um, we have, uh, I'll give one example actually, it was close to my heart. We did a pilot a few years ago for um, young Māori and Pacific graduates to come into a management development programme because in the health sector, you don't really become a manager and be able to make those decisions unless you've actually come through a clinical pathway. So that's a double whammy really for our young Māori and Pacific people. So we developed this program, we did a pilot, we proved it worked, um, and then we haven't been able to do it since because there's been no funding. Because we want to be able to pay these young people to do a two-year program, to come into the hospitals and to um, be supernumerary for the first six months, then to pick up project work, to sit in the meetings, to learn. Um, and so that is still on our agenda. It's been on our agenda for two years in my plan, trying to find funding. So he's a good example of something that we could scale up and make a huge difference when we think about um, the care that and the care decisions that are made in terms of the health sector. Thank you. Right. Um, I'm not sure I can solve your funding problems, but if anyone in the room can, <laughs> please stand up. 
Um, I I'd take the opportunity. Warwick, just staying with the training piece. So, you know, traditionally our view has been that you go to an, an education institution or, or training provider to learn new sort of different skills. And what you're saying is that our whole concept of, of where training occurs and how it occurs and who's taking that is going to change. Uh, really interested in what you talked about with the small businesses. How do we help them? How do we support them to provide the training that they need to provide? Yeah, so um, it's been difficult with the current settings because we've had 16 politics and 11 ITOs all competing with each other. None of us have had the, have, have the funding or the scale to actually address these problems across New Zealand. Now that Te Pukinga is forming, and it's not a mega poly by the way, I just want to reinforce that, it is an institution that provides classroom-based digital learning and work-based learning in whatever means and needs the individual or the firm requires. So to some degree, um, making sure that we understand our employers at the kind of the persona level, understand that this profile of employer tends to have these sorts of issues and they are scalable across the country, you can then introduce things that are different. Uh, and issues like diversity and you know, how to engage with minority groups is a key factor because that's the, that's the workforce of the future. And unless our firms are able to understand that and accommodate that change, then they will struggle. Um, you either get skills from two sources. You either grow your own or you pinch them, either from overseas or off each other. And the, la the latter two is risky. You've seen it with COVID, and we see it with our firms flogging each other's talent for one or two dollars an hour extra. Uh, and so upskilling and retraining in the workplace is going to be much more prevalent. In New Zealand, we have a high proportion of vet learning in institutions. It's about 45%. Overseas, it's 10, 15%, because the employers and the, and, and the system are intricately linked, and they provide that support. And that's one of our key challenges. But if we can do that, we're well on the way to actually helping firms train and teach well, because we want the experience to be good. Otherwise, the learners, the apprentices, the individuals fall out. Thank you. Um, Robert, one of the things we heard this morning from, from the mayor, from um, Nick Hill from Auckland Unlimited, uh, and some other speakers, was Auckland as the place where talent wants to live and where talent thrives. Can you share with us what you are hearing in terms of cost of living in Auckland and what that means for our workforce? It is one of our biggest problems, I think. Um, and um, we could say, well, inflation has only gone up by, if, if it's the lowest it's ever been. Well, it's the lowest it's ever been um, because housing inflation is not included in our, in our inflation figures. Um, and for workers, um, low, medium, and uh, even above the mythical government's $100,000 a year, uh, cap on, on wage increases are finding it more and more difficult uh, to live uh, and therefore work uh, in Tamaki Makauro. So, um, it, it, but it's such a complex problem. I mean, it, it, it involves, yes, building more houses, um, but it does involve uh, needing to have higher wages. So it was very good this morning uh, to hear from the Tamaki 10,000 uh, group uh, that they are wanting to get jobs for Māori that are at least uh, the average or 10% above the average of, the, of wages for everybody across this industry. So that means not just paying a minimum wage of $20 an hour, not even paying the living wage of $22 or $23 an hour, um, but actually having wages uh, that are above, at least above $30 an hour for the people who are employed here. So I do get very worried, and I might ask one of the Slido questions now, when some employers and some employer representatives make out that increasing the minimum wage to $20 is going to bring capitalism down as we know it, that increasing or starting these fair pay agreements, which will still see New Zealand as having one of the most deregulated market, labour markets in the world, um, and not even regulated as much as Australia, which has had conservative governments for many, many years who could have changed their system, those are the things that actually have to happen. So in an audience, not entirely, but of business people, I, my plea to you 
uh, would be don't spend your energies over the next few months attacking the government or attacking us or whatever to say the minimum wage is too high, we shouldn't have fair pay agreements. Do what we've heard you talk about this morning and get on with your job of building your firms because your firms will only be able to exist if, you have, if the workers in them are able to have enough money to live decently in Tamaki Makauro and contribute to that. Thank you, Robert. I feel like that needs an applause. So here's a question, and actually, any one of you can answer, and a number of you represent uh, Regional Skills Group and Te Pukinga um, and Workforce Development Council. So how well do we understand future workforce needs across multiple sectors? And do we have a plan, or how do we build a plan to deliver against that? Um, I, I can talk from a construction perspective having a construction background. Uh, we, we think we understand our workforce needs quite well. Uh, we have analysis up the wazoo. Forecasts for 10 years. The people retiring, the people coming in by trade, by location, by age, by everything. What we don't have is the ability to respond to it. Other than look at it and go, well, that's interesting. What do we do now? It just stops. So what are the levers that the government needs to put in place through WDC, through Te Puking, or through other mechanisms to actually respond to these things? Because forecasting's all well and good, even if it's really accurate. If you can't respond to it, it's a waste of time. So I think that's the challenge. We can all do some forecasting. It's never going to be perfect. It's the mechanisms to respond that's missing. So to that then, in Auckland, do we have the right um, training or education providers or employers who provide training in the right places that serve the region. So I'm thinking here, and Robert, you might want to pitch in as well, um, and, and Beatrice with, with South Auckland. Um, we've got institutions in the city centre, we've got a university campus in Albany, we've got Unitech, we've got MIT. What about if we went further north and what if we went further south? No, we don't. Um, and, and I think I might have said last year that you know, for in the ITP sector, uh, we have um, one polytech which has campuses in Manukau and Otara, another one which has campuses in Mount Roskill and, um, and uh, Henderson. Nothing south of that, nothing north of that. The great thing about the reforms, I think, of vocational education, and, and, and Warwick uh, bangs on about this all the time correctly, is that we are going to, though, have in every workplace should also be a training establishment. So that immediately gives us a spread um, from beyond the tunnels, as I call it, down to the Bombay Hills. But there also probably needs to be some bricks and mortar hubs um, um, around Tamaki Makaro to make sure that people don't have to shift so, so regularly. We had, um, uh, we, we just had the other day, you're on the MIT uh, uh, and Unitech boards with me about how far people travel to come to learn at those institutions. Um, and it was something like um, 16 kilometers um, each way for one institution and 32 for the other was the average travel. We have to do better than that and that'll stop clogging up the roads at the same time. So related to, sort of related to that, but, but beyond that, I mean, one of the changes that we've seen coming through a number of years, but actually um, exacerbated by COVID, was the number of self-employed, the increase in the number of self-employed uh, folk, the number of people having portfolio careers or you know the gig economy. How can those people be supported to ensure that they're able to contribute fully, that they are earning uh, appropriately and receiving the training and help that they need so they can contribute fully to our workforce needs? Anyone want to have a stab at that? Sure. Um, those of the Pacific sector, please don't hesitate to contact, contact us at PBT. If we, if we can't facilitate the support that you need, we absolutely will do introductions for other organisations that could be of help. I think the other piece that uh, also needs to sit with this too is the open conversation, creating partnerships so that all of us can learn together and then find solutions together as well, absolutely. And, and with, with technology now, you can make connections you couldn't make before. So whilst we might have an ageing workforce, a lot of us want to give back. You know, we don't want to stop. And we can mentor, we can support, we can help with skill development remotely now, where we could never do it before with bricks and mortar. So don't underestimate the power of connection through technology. 
uh, and you can mentor nationally, not just a local person because of these, you know, these abilities. And I think that's the flip side of what's actually positive because we've got a massive amount of experience walking out the door that we don't want to lose. Uh, and many institutions have that problem with their ageing workforce. That IP that sits up here goes. So how do they keep it? So Brilliant. Thank technology you. does that. We, we are running, running out of time here, but the panel will be here through the rest of the afternoon and available during um, afternoon tea as well if you have more questions and, and would like to approach them with that. Um, thank you very much to our panellists. Can we put our hands together for them? You know, and if I can just sum up by saying, you know, we've heard this morning that New Zealand can't succeed if Auckland doesn't succeed. And Auckland doesn't succeed unless Aucklanders and all Aucklanders succeed. Um, so that would be the, the point that I'd like to leave uh, with us all. Noreira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato kato. Thank you. <laughs>